all of the major metro areas, um, Des Moines, surrounding cities, um, Iowa City, Ames, Dubuque, et cetera. Waterloo, however, does not have one. So that's why we'd like to take a look at implementing that here. A couple reasons to look at adopting a food truck ordinance. Um, first and foremost, a code change. We've got a couple different business licenses in our city code, um, but none of them <coughs> really fit with this type of business. Um, we've got a peddler's license and a transient merchant license. Other cities, uh, city clerk's offices issue those type of licenses and have taken the steps to convert to a food truck so that it fits with the type of business that's being regulated. Um, sanitation, want to make sure that there's a plan for collecting litter. Anytime you're eating outside, there's, you know, paper plates, napkins, forks, etc. And then also um, wanting to make sure that there's a plan for how cooking grease is getting disposed of. Parking, planning and zoning would be reviewing um, parking for locations where vending would take place to ensure that there's adequate space for vehicles for the business and then also for the food truck. And then fire safety is the last reason that we want to take a look at having a food truck license. And we've got our fire marshal, Brock Willoughby, here to talk to us about fire safety. Hello, Brock Willoughby with Waterloo Fire Rescue. And nationally, uh, cooking fires are one of our biggest uh, fires in both residential and commercial structures. Uh, so it's no surprise that when you put these on four wheels and move them down the road, uh, those scenarios uh, continue to follow. So NFPA 96 has uh, adopted a new uh, standard in 2021. And when we do uh, adopt a new 2021 uh, IFC codes, that should be adopted with that as well. Um, and so there are some uh, regulations in there as far as, you know, uh, the amount of LP uh, stored on some of these vehicles. are contained within the, the, the food truck themselves and then setbacks from commercial properties or for the ingress or egress out of those commercial structures as well. Um, so for, um, for the fire safety check for the ordinance, or excuse me, for the license, um, the fire department would do a review of class three and class four food service licenses. So the class refers to um, handling um, perishable food products. So anytime you're taking raw hamburger and cooking it on a grill, you wanna make sure that it's cooked to a certain standard. And then naturally when you have a grill, that's gonna trigger having LP, things like that on the food truck. And then we'd also be proposing adding a site inspection for fire safety at special events. We wouldn't be requiring those food trucks to get a food service, or excuse me, to get a mobile food vendor license, but we would be going through and doing a site inspection because you're gonna have a lot of LP tanks around a city park in a very confined space. So the potential for an issue is definitely there. So who does and does not need a food truck license? Um, basically, anybody selling food to the public from a food truck, push cart, or temporary structure would need to get a license. Exempt types of businesses would be a catering business, a concession stand at a sports or recreational venue, farmer's market. So if you're selling, if you're growing corn and you're selling it at the farmer's market, you don't have to have a, a food truck license. Um, restaurants and businesses that would be delivering food orders directly to customers. Route delivery drivers not making incidental sales, and then children operating a lemonade or food stand. Those are, surprisingly, I learned, children's food stands are already exempted from state law, so no need to worry about that. A little bit. What about the events? So, like a, a vendor at um, Friday Lou, do they have to have the permit? So, we would propose that they not have to get the permit. Um, but we would propose that they go through a site inspection. Down Every the time that they set up? Yep, just to kind of take a look at the overall layout of 
food vendors Every setting time. up. Yep. Okay. Um, down the road, what we would like to look at doing is a special event permit. So then those types of checks would be occurring anyway as part of the setup for the special event. That's for another another day. Okay. A <laughs> um, little bit about the application process. So the ordinance we put together is based off of um, a license for um, that was written out of Clive. A lot of the Des Moines um, metro communities have similar requirements. And then I also based the application process off of Cedar Falls, so that if you're applying over in Cedar Falls, you're basically going to be giving us the same kind of licensing requirements, so it's nothing in addition in either community. Um, so we'd be gathering the applicant's contact information, and if they were operating out of a vehicle, the driver's license, um, make, model, et cetera, of the vehicle. We'd ask for a photograph of the mobile food unit, along with a sketch for the vending setup, including trash cans and seating. Plan for disposing of liquid and solid waste. List of locations where the applicant would operate, and then a sales tax permit, a food establishment license, and proof of insurance. The application would then be reviewed by police, fire, planning and zoning, and other relevant departments. So let's say they wanted to set up in Lincoln Park, for example. We'd send it over to Leisure Services to give that approval. Um, and then any time a license would be recommended for denial, there would be an appeals process for the applicant to go through where they would appeal that decision to the city council. License term and fees, um, proposing a tiered license term setup. Um, a seven day license would be $50, 30 day license could be $100, and a one year license, $500. Um, looked at some of the other larger communities, and I would kind of um, determine what is reasonable or kind of what the trend is for those licensing fees. Cedar Falls does $50 for a one month license, $500 for a one year license. Iowa City was pretty high with $1,000 for a one year license. Dubuque has it structured based off of the number of locations. And then Cedar Rapids, um, which I, I thought was a good way to go, was that same tiered license structure of $100 for a week. 300 for six months, 550 for one year, and then on top of that, they charge a $50 application fee for filing the application. Kelly? Yep. Have you considered the six months since some of these food trucks are in, in service during the winter months? Say that again? I said, have you cons we, it looks like you're doing 730 in one year, mm -hmm. whereas Cedar Rapids does, you know, seven. You know, then they do six months in one year. And the reason I, I was asking about the six month license is because a lot of food truck vendors don't, don't operate in the winter time. Right. But yet they're buying a year license. Mm -hmm. Have you considered anything like that to put it a six month? Yeah, could definitely there? consider that. You know? okay. Yeah, this Thank is you. this is very open for open to suggestion. And the fee is every time. So if there is seven day they would have to every time they move to a new location for a new seven days, they'd have to have. Yeah, and that was more or less to kind of create a more flexible license for a food truck that would come in from out of town. Mm -hmm. There are a couple that do come from um, different communities that just set up for a day, post on Facebook that, hey, we're going to be at this location on this day, and then they don't come back for like a month or so. Billy. Yep. Any idea of how many actual trucks we're talking as far as in the city that We operate? believe there's about 10 that operate either pretty regularly or periodically come into town. So not a ton of food trucks, but we have started to see more pop up mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. And I think we will see more. Yeah. 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 I think it's really starting to catch on in our community. Um, then operating rules. Um, sales would be allowed from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. each day. Um, kind of the thought process behind that was um, farmer's market, for example, that gets started at 8 o'clock on Saturday mornings, and there are some food trucks that come there, so we want to accommodate their ability to sell um, early in the morning. And then 10 p.m., that cutoff time is primarily for public safety. Um, we felt that it would be um, wise to shut off sales around 10, especially if 
Um, there was a food truck setting up downtown. Don't necessarily want groups of people gathering around bar close time downtown. So, so if you've got a food vendor that comes to the farmer's market, if they're not a weekly, if they're not a member of that farmer's market, then this would apply to them, yep. even though they're setting up right by a farmer's Correct. market. Yep. Okay. Yep. Kelly, could there be a maybe a special exemption or something? I know, you know, Jessica at Main Street had the food truck set up um, over on 4th Street not this past year, but the year before, you know, up until like 1 or 2 a.m., is that possible that we could have a special exemption or something like that? Yeah, as well? I do have it in the ordinance that if they're vending, like for a special event, for example, okay. they have to stay open for the duration. Of, they can stay open for that okay. duration okay. of that event. Because I know Irish Fest goes past yeah. ten yep. as yep. well. Yep. And on the on the ten p.m., I, I I do know there's one over on Eleventh Street that stays open quite late because a lot of third shift cops go over there and eat. Mm, okay. Mm. But that would. At, at, at 11th and, and Sycamore or Lafayette over there. Um, so I was just curious when they sh shut them down at 10 p.m. It's, it's Yeah, and the recommendation came from the police from department. Yeah. Well, evidently, they don't want them going But maybe over that there. individual <laughs> doesn't eat at that food truck, so we may have to that talk about it more. first shift. <laughs> yep, he does. <laughs> okay. Um, use of amplified sound, flashing lights, noise-making devices, et cetera, would be prohibited. Um, vending would be prohibited permitted on hard surface areas and parks and on private and public parking lots I'm trying to get away from having sales occurring in the street people gathering in the street the potential for someone to get hit by a vehicle um, and then this would also incorporate an existing approval process that leisure services has in place for um, proposing to vend within city parks and then finally the license would have to be displayed on the vehicle somewhere and then we will be looking at implementing this in January of 2022 so in the event that the food truck would have to potentially purchase additional equipment to meet um, fire safety standards there would be plenty of time hopefully to get everything up to snuff so that they'd be able to pass fire inspections that's it any questions yeah Kelly um that, uh, as uh, Councilman Bowles mentioned, there's this place over on um, uh, Sycamore, not Sycamore, Lafayette, I believe, and, and 11th Street. And I know I've had complaints uh, that that thing is parked there all the time. Uh, is there going to be a restriction on the length of time that a food truck or vendor could be at a certain location, uh, such as they have to move uh, every couple of days or something like that, which the complaining party to me on several occasions has said that there is a uh, day amount that uh, a, par or a truck can be parked and it needs to be moved. So is this ordinance going to address that issue as well? Yeah, um, the ordinance addresses, um, so if you vend on public property, you have to move it off each day at the close of business. Um, it doesn't necessarily address private property. However, that situation could maybe be addressed with the, um, the code enforcement, um, the parking regulations, having to move your vehicle. Is that just with the food truck on private, private property? Truck. Or is that just within the street? Just There's one at six corners that's almost permanent because it has a its own electricity stand, you know, mm -hmm. post there and everything. We could look at that. Yeah, that area needs to be addressed. Also, um, the uh, concern that I have about waste uh, discharge, either on public or private property from these, and I, I, I know that there's uh, going to be some guidelines, but I would hope there would also be a fine schedule established if they're dumping okay. any of their waste on uh, either public or private property. That, that I would take that as being a nuisance kind of issue as well as a sanitation issue. Right, Randy? Hello. No, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Randy's getting ready for his presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yep. Um, how does this play into ice cream trucks? Are they the same thing um, or no? So ice cream trucks would then fall under this. This. Yep. 
ice cream trucks is part of the reason why we're looking at redoing the code. They just don't really fit well with um, the business licenses that we have in place now. Um, the last time those were looked at trucks. was 2005, and ice cream trucks technically qualify as a transient merchant, but those fees are it's like $45 per day, which I think is a little unreasonable. So they'd move over to the food truck requirement. Yep. Can we regulate what music they play? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know we still had ice cream we, trucks. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of kids in our neighborhood. Oh, mm -hmm. gosh, I want to tell them to come down my street. <laughs> they run. It's that same song. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> when are you going to bring this back to us, Kelly? Um, I can, I'll need to make a couple tweaks based on conversation today, and I could potentially bring it back um, end of July. Okay. Cool. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. With that, I'm going to turn it over to, no, I'm not going to turn it over. <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. Keep going. All right. Thank you very much, Kelly. Yep. Next on our agenda is a presentation from Randy Bennett about waste management and the CMOM. So all over to you, buddy. All right, perfect. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Randy Bennett, Public Works Division Manager. Um, so first off, I guess I'd like to just start off. Um, wasn't long after I started, we had some turnover in staff. And in that process, we actually looked at restructuring the waste management um, department. Um, originally, it was kind of set up to where we had a department head along with a collection supervisor and then a treatment supervisor. Um, after kind of evaluating just how the, pro um, the oversight of that department was, we actually did decided to restructure it to have a, a director of um, treatment and a director of uh, collection and um, project management. And then a new position for which we are um, in the process of interviewing right now, which would be um, for a safety and compliance director. Um, so that way can uh, assist with uh, training not only in waste management, but all of, um, all six departments within public works and then eventually um, hopefully be able to expand throughout the city as well. So um, that's probably one of the, the largest things that, um, you know, that we've kind of done as far as the restructuring goes um, as far as when it comes to waste management. Um, so the first portion that we're actually going to talk about um, this afternoon is going to be the CMOM program, and I'm actually going to turn it over to our um, CMOM coordinator, um, Laura, which she'll kind of give you the update on that. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Laura Mass, CMOM coordinator at Waste Management. Um, I think you guys hear CMOM and consent decree a lot, and um, sometimes they're used interchangeably. And hopefully, my presentation kind of clears up that division. Can you lower your your microphone there? And, yeah, How's that? So you can do that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So uh, one of the things discussed at our initial CMOM team meeting in October 2015 was a production of a quarterly report to address the items listed out in the consent decree to kind of keep us on track. Um, we submit courtesy copies of our operating report every month and any DNR reports we might have to the EPA. We use that opportunity to also submit these progress reports. Um, those are available, distributed through the city and also available to public upon request. Um, we use those reports to um, produce our annual status report, which is a required item. Um, our CMOM program was a document that was drafted in response to the impending consent decree. Um, the consent decree's express purpose, as we know, is to follow the Clean Water Act, and um, the CMOM program encompasses those requirements, but also kind of clears up policies, procedures, et cetera, um, for everything associated with managing, um, operating, and ma maintaining our collection system. Um, that is a, a living document, and we update it as needed. If there's major updates, um, we get those pre-approved by the EPA. Oh, my slide. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So this table right here are the actual required projects for the master plan for the consent decree. 
Um, we had submitted the master plan in 2018 and then um, had some follow-up correspondence between the city and them um, to kind of finally settle on this table of 12 projects. Those top items <clears throat> in gray are complete. We consider those complete. They include the foundation footing drain removal program in 15 and 16, service area 15 and 16, um, CIPP projects phase 3B and 3C, removal of some storm sewer inlets in service area 12, and smoke testing in service area 18. Those projects highlighted in green are going on right now. Um, we've got the Dry Run Creek lift station and interceptor, which is expected to be complete this summer. Um, Titus lift station and force main design. Design is underway and construction is expected to bid this fall. And then also the CIPP project phase 4A. Phase 4A was completed in November of 2020 and phase 4A2 was just bid last week. Um, those three projects at the bottom in red, um, with discussions with the EPA, those have been kind of pushed back to further timelines um, to reevaluate, to see if they're still necessary. Um, the master plan also lays out projects for CMOM. So the projects that were scheduled for 2018 to 2020, um, are shown here. We've got, um, let's see, we've got in, um, investigations in the east and west side interceptor. Um, in 2019 and in 2020, we did some um, inspections of that large diameter pipe that runs along the river on both sides, and then also two phases of manhole inspections. Um, Waste management with city engineering continues to address identified storm sewer cross connections. And then, uh, again, CIPP phase 4A2. So a current project we've got kind of fast-tracked is the Highway 63 interceptor upgrade. In 2015, we did hydraulic modeling that identified capacity constraints along this corridor. Um, and a need for potential improvements depending on future development. This area, um, that area circled there in blue, is it includes Jane Street, Upland and Muncie, and the Home Park Boulevard area, the hot spots for SSOs and basement backups. We had four stakeholder meetings to design, to obtain design input and get information out to the public. Um, the design and construction for these improvements is planned in three phases. Phase one is approximately five million and will upsize that large diameter pipe that runs along 63 from a 21 inch to a 48 inch um, from Home Park to Jane. Design is at 90% and phase one is expected to bid in the fall. Um, part of that phase one also includes a relief sewer from Home Park, to Flet from Home Park and Fletcher to hopefully mitigate future SSOs and backups um, in Home Park and Lawn Hill vicinity. So what we've got upcoming for 2021 to 2023 is laid out in the master plan. Um, it includes improvements to the Douglas lift station and force main. We have temporarily have a temporary installed force main now at Douglas. Um, we're We've got ongoing investigations as to the I and I in that area. And then CIPP phase four and more storm sewer cross connection removals. So the connection of a storm sewer, a catch basin, a drain in the street um, to our sanitary system is part of the overload issue that we experience since the execution of the consent decree. Uh, we have had 40 storm intakes disconnected and the remaining identified cross connections are in service areas 12, 11, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 19. 12, 12 more connections are scheduled for removal in 2021 to 2023. The CMOM program lays out annual goals for cleaning and televising of the sanitary sewer to meet our overall goal, which is um, to clean 
every five years and televise every 10 years the 400 miles in the sanitary system. Our TV vans are equipped with Q's equipment. That uh, lower corner there is one of our televising, our cameras. Um, they're equipped with Q's equipment and use Granite software for recording and grading each inspection. Um, we pulled a report that showed through the end of June and it showed us at about 35% of our annual goal. Um, that's actually doing pretty good. The summer and fall are when we get the most televising work done. So um, we are right on target. Uh, waste management uses televising as its uh, main investigative tool. It's not always the fastest or most efficient. This slide shows um, the line that runs through the Herb Warren golf course. After flooding in 2018, we televised part of that. In 2019, we smoke tested part of it. And in 2020, we did um, a demo for this acoustic inspection, um, the equipment that showed in the kind of the middle of that slide. Um, those acoustic inspections transmit signal measure and grade and produce a report that we can layer in our GIS and we're looking into purchasing that this fiscal year. Um, about 2,000 feet was inspected in 45 minutes that day. Um, when we TV, 2,000 feet might take the whole day or multiple days, depending on how rough a shape that line is in. Um, and then we've also purchased our own smoke test equipment we would previously contract that service out. But since the purchase of our equipment, we have tested Burnbray Airline and LaPorte Road lift station areas upstream of 8th and Lock and also a portion along the Cedar River. Okay, so this slide shows some of the recently purchased equipment we have for more cost-effective in-house repairs. Um, those top photos were, let's see, the 600 block of Boston. We discovered that break in the pipe. You can see it at the top of the pipe in the before photo um, this spring. And that line is really deep. It's not something that our crews could have um, dug and repaired ourselves. But we have these sleeves that you send down. Um, they expand, and um, it's a full structural strength repair. Um, a sleeve like that for an eight inch pipe is about $800 and the repair is done in about half a day. If we did a dig, it would be multiple days of work. And then the bottom photos show a manhole along the Cedar River on the west side. Um, we have purchased these rapid seal sleeves. Um, it's a heat shrink sheet and um, seals that manhole structure. This is a manhole that would be a source of inflow in flooding events prior to sealing. <coughs> and the last slide for me is the rainfall and flow monitoring program that the consent decree requires us to have through our CMOM program. Um, we have value calc meters at lift stations, area velocity meters at manholes, groundwater elevation wells, rain gauges, uh, river gauges and use weather data to determine potential I and I sources, um, identify areas we want to investigate, and um, potentially identify any capacity constraints as they develop. We use this data to preserve a historical picture of wet weather and flooding um, and uh, identify trends over time. Um, Currently, all of this data is collected manually on weekly or monthly basis. Uh, future integration with SCADA would allow for real-time data analysis. Uh, we also produce a report that's included with our annual status report. Good job, thank you. So as she was just kind of talking there just a little bit on the SCADA system, uh, this is a new software that we just completed in 2020. And um, what this does, it's actually a supervisory control of data um, um, 
acquisition. So it, it gives our staff real time, either through a laptop or a, a touchpad, to let us know whatever is going on um, anywhere within the plant, to let us know what pumps, blowers, um, float controls, everything that's being able to work. We also have that in all of the buildings out into the wastewater plant. It also is tied into our lagoon, so the same thing that we can get um, real life um, data out there, so that way we can uh, tie it into um, our software, so we can do a lot of trending as far as you know, uh, recording flows and, and um, other data that would be taking place as far as their maintenance that are um, that would need to be there. This also is very intricate. Like I said, when our staff, when it comes to night and weekends, um, they would be able to see and be able to turn things on and off if need be. Um, if, you know, if, if an emergency was to arise. Um, some other uh, software that, of course, we're looking at, um, kind of part of our other presentations that we're doing is Elements. And uh, this is a software in the process right now of trying to um, get off the ground here. And what this is going to actually be able to do is tie into our, um, where she kind of commented a little bit earlier, our televising and our cleaning. So then that way, where now we do a lot of uh, paper documentations, this way we can kind of tie it right into that, do that electronic work order. So that way when it comes to the record keeping portion, um, it'll hopefully uh, streamline that and then also give us um, better access to be able to retrieve that data when we need to um, go back and, and um, do follow-ups as far as trending and, and so on and so forth. So um, that's kind of like our, our two larger ones. Like I said, the one was finished in 2020 and the elements were in the process now. And then on the publication, um, Portion, I am actually going to turn that portion over to Brian. Good afternoon. Um, first off, congratulations, Laura. I thought she did a great job on presentation. Her yes. work is so valuable to us. Um, she's incredible uh, resource for me. She knows the rules of the consent decree. She knows where we're at. I'm always knocking on her door or texting her. So thank you for that, Laura. We're talking now about the public education piece. One of the things that I think we're in a dire need of is to keep residents informed on what they can do to mitigate some of these things. We, we seems like we talk in code sometimes. We talk about, you know, you got to have backflow preventers. You got to have your sump pump. You know, what we want to do is really give uh, an education piece to residents to inform them on how they can not only help themselves, but that how they can help their neighbors and their citizens right next to each other, and ultimately how they can help us. So we're gonna be coordinating not only through Laura's office and Randy um, to get out a public education piece and maybe work with some neighborhood association groups to get this information out and to really inform residents so that we can move down the road and have people informed. So, good. Yeah. Good. Any questions about the CMOM um, portion of the presentation? Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. I, I just had a question on the on the Dry Run Creek uh, lift station and interceptor, and it's supposed to be completed this this fall, is what. But I drive Correct. by it on a daily basis, and I haven't seen people working there forever. Um, hmm. So I'm I'm just curious. I mean how we're going to accomplish that goal and the other the other concern i had on that is if you drive by there today you'll see a double manway hatch opened up like this and an extension ladder sticking down in it but there's nothing to prevent any kids or public or anybody from climbing down that ladder and and i have to agree with you on a lot of your points dave um that is something that i've been trying to manage with with the contractor that we have if you remember the the bids were wildly different yes okay um there's not a day that goes by that I don't have a conversation with our consulting engineer and trying to get our contractor to move faster on, on this project. It is overdue, um, but we are moving forward in some important phases, and I have hope that we're going to be closing this project out. I'm, I've been I'm really on it on a significantly. Aspect, though, sir, on, the, on that extension ladder that's going down on that pit. And I'm not quite sure. I was out there today. Now, we have multiple, we have an old structure which is our current wet well. And then we have three new existing um, structures. One is a wet well, one's a dry pit, one's for flow monitoring. That might be new to me and opened er earlier this week or something, because I was out there today and I did not see that. It, it, was, uh, it was left unattended all weekend with a ladder. It, that's concerning. And it is for me. 
and it, well, not only that's concerning, but just the site in general has been concerning to me, and there has been a lot of correspondence concerning this contract and this contractor. Okay, thank I you. assure you, I, I've been on it pretty diligently, sure. and probably too aggressively at times, though. Well, thank you. I would say. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Morris. Yeah, uh, uh, Brian, uh, I know it was mentioned about uh, the software and the program that, that is there. The Elements? Yeah. Or yeah, SCADA. Or televising, cleaning, and how it's all stored, data, uh, and that. Um, and my, my question is, what happens with that data if it's, the system is hacked? You get a virus or just the computer shut down? Sure. We, we have a lot of data, not only on our, on our personal um, hard drives and stuff, but we also have a, a city server. And I'll let Chris speak to anything on this, but we, we feel pretty safe that not only do we have a lot of zip drives of, of camera footage and stuff, but we're also backed up on a city server. And Chris, do you have anything to add on that? I guess I'm bringing him into wastewater treatment. <laughs> <laughs> Chris does it all. Uh, Brian, Brian and Chris, in other words, is there any way, is there any possibility that all that data can be lost? So I'm never going to Because say of never. these electronic systems and everybody's so dependent on them anymore. Um, so I won't ever say never, but um, we do have uh, things in place. Um, we have not only backup systems, but we have redundant backup systems. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're backing up in one location, archiving it to another location. So we have multiple backup locations, as well as we have um, software in place. Um, we actually just went to a new antivirus and anti-malware application this earlier this spring called CrowdStrike. And um, uh, we feel like we've... Um, put things in place to do the best job we can to prevent this. Now, there's no system out there that's not 100%. You can say that it's not going to be hacked or something. But we feel that we've put everything in place that we need to to prevent that. And, and we continue to work on that every day, every week. We look at how we can make it even more difficult to put things in place. Um, we're putting some things in place called uh, two-factor authentication, which... Um, for those that access remotely, not only do they have to put a password in, they also have to have some physical device like a cell phone that they get a code on um, that they also have to put that in. So it's a, just another thing that we're implementing um, to try to prevent any um, anything that could happen. So, Chris, it sounds like there's several different backups to this. There is. This data, okay. There is. Because we don't want to have just a backup. We want to make sure that we're taking that backup and we're putting it somewhere um, in case something happened to the backup. So. Okay. Okay. It, the, and the other thing that, that I had, uh, Brian and, and uh, Brian and Laura, is that uh, this is supposed to go out to people, uh, the public, uh, you know, hopefully 70,000 plus uh, people outside the area who really rely on Waterloo for some intelligent conversation. And uh, so... I just have a request, and that is that when terms like interceptor, um, uh, lift station, CMOM, these acronyms are used, could every now and then you please at least say what they are <laughs> so that people are not just listening to words and saying, well, I hope the hell they know what they're talking about. It, you know, it would be nice to have the public know exactly what it is that you are talking about in lay terms. And that's just a request on my part, Brian. We appreciate that input. And that's a good, I'm wondering if you're putting together public education, having a glossary, have some place where all these acronyms and mm -hmm. commonly used that most of us don't understand what they are, if you would have that that glossary of terms, I think that'd be very helpful. Well, we certainly appreciate that kind of input. Um, we live in a universe of acronyms and, and shortcuts. So You talk funny all the time, <laughs> I <Brian>. do. <laughs> <laughs> all of you do. Great. Any other questions? Okay, good job. All right. Back to you, Randy. Right. Or? I'll let you go then, Laura. 
I know she's got a swim well, meet she has to go to. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Uh, oh, I was going to wait to the end, Laura, but uh, they are correct. I remember uh, when we first started this journey, uh, what, five and a half, six years ago to start actually addressing this. Uh, you were kind of thrown in the mix. Uh, you've been that rock uh, that have kept ke things consistent and moving forward. There's a lot that people don't know on the other side and challenges, but you have been incredible. So I want to thank you so much for your efforts and your work, and I ditto everything that Brian said. Keep up the good work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're going to move on to treatment, your favorite thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so here is uh, my presentation on treatment. We have a mission, and of course the mission kind of coincides with collection in some way. So our mission, you know, of the Waste Management Services Department is to properly operate and maintain the collection system, Laura, and the sewer maintenance crew. Um, and we maintain that system infrastructure. We transport and treat wastewater without disruption or overflows. That is our goal. While meeting the needs of Waterloo citizens, protecting surface and groundwater resources, and complying with all federal and state regulations. That little paragraph sums up a ton of work <laughs> that we do every day. So here's some of our major accomplishments. Now, I don't want to sit here and read every one of our accomplishments. You guys all have eyes. So I'm going to highlight a couple of one, one of the big ones. Um, through legal appeal, with the DNR, they agreed to reinstate our previous waste load allocation and permit limits. Our MPDS permit was reissued June 1st, 2021. In essence, um, the DNR uh, did not like the way our water was uh, diffusing across the Cedar River. And if you remember, we built a wing dike and then we performed a bunch of studies. They still didn't like it. And eventually we had to lobby with them extensively to get our permit limits back reinstated. We got those reinstated, and this is super important to us because it preserves not only our future for economic growth, but it gives not our, our treatment process a little bit of cushion in case, you know, we're dealing with biology here. You know, it gives us a little bit of cushion that we can reside in the permit limits. So that was a huge deal, having the NPDS permit, and again, here's, I'm, I'm acronyming you again, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. That's your permit that you get from the EPA that's mandated to get, that's issued through the DNR and then passed on to us. So that was a huge accomplishment for this year. Um, other things, we've got a satellite wet well project continues. I'll have a slide on that later on. Uh, our bio, uh, dry run creek interceptor and lift station work continues. Completion is scheduled. I had, I had it July early July, I don't think we're gonna make that. Um, I have been, like I said to Councilman Bozen, I've been on this contractor and, and hopefully we'll be finishing that up at least by the end of the summer. Uh, our biosolids contract is going at full steam. I'm very pleased with this contract. We have a, a good engineering firm at the helm and a good contractor. We're currently at 57% completion. Um, it's a big project that means a lot to us. Uh, other, other items, um, I know last year we cleaned and replaced all the aeration membranes in the Eastern Aeration Basin number three. This is an annual goal that we have to go, we've got four basins, to go through each basin, to pump them dry so that staff can get down there. And basically what they're doing is they're replacing, think, think of a, a, a PVC tree, and at the end of the PVC tree there's these membranes. There's 726 of them. This is a big deal, guys. It's a, it's a safety deal. Uh, to contract this out would be a lot of money. So we started doing it ourselves, but it is extensive work and things have to be done right. Last year we did basin number three. We filled it back up with wastewater. It wasn't behaving right. We had to drain it back down. So this is the kind of stuff that we're tackling now in our facility with our staff that makes a big difference. You're not going to see my name associated with big contracts anymore for these kind of services because I feel this is something that we can do. So this year, one of my goals is to get to Aeration Basin 4, and then we're set, set for another five years before we got to go back and revisit this. So 
if, if anybody's ever, you know, if you guys are interested in coming down, I'd be glad to show you this because right now we're getting ready for kickoff on basin number four. Other, other major accomplishes, uh, of course, we did our CIPP phase 4A. That was closed out in November. We're working on some preliminary design on Titus Lift Station, um, which is a, a pretty major player out in the lift station field. Um, we've got a final clarifier, uh, number 3D watering project was complete, and now we're looking at, at ways to move forward on our final clarifier. Uh, we hosted some stakeholder meetings for the Highway 63. Margaret, you were part of that, and we appreciate your input on that. Uh, we submitted an intended use plan to the DNR for that Highway 63, and we applied for the construction permit. Some goals. Like I said, we're going to rebuild that basin number four diffuser. We're moving forward on CIPP phase 4A2. Uh, talking about the clarifier, we're going to develop those plans and specs and submit them to council. Part of our NPDS uh, permit that was issued this year, we do have to submit another nutrient reduction strategy. If you remember about four years ago, five years ago, we did that. We have to do it again because it's mandated it, since we didn't make any major improvements in the nutrient reduction. So the DNR has given us a pass. Now we get to submit it again. So that'll be coming down that. We're going to uh, begin some of the design on the anaerobic lagoon gas collection upgrades. Um, We'll continue to uh, administer and monitor these projects that we got, not only in the plant, but out in the field. Again, I hope to close out Dry Run Creek. And big and most importantly to me is, is continue to maintain treatment compliance with all state and federal uh, guidelines. I talk about DNR compliance um, and NPDS permit. I kind of already outlined what that is. There's the verbiage on it. To give you an idea of what's all in our permit, I mean, the significant work has to be done. We have to collect samples. We, we conduct 133 daily tests on influent and effluent to comply with our NPDS permit. That's not including all the operational monitoring that we do on the side. Just to maintain, to look at our spreadsheets, see where we are in treatment. It's, it's a complicated science, but there's a lot of art to it as well, all right? Uh, here's here's uh, part of our permit is that we do get inspected by the EPA and the DNR. The DNR comes out every two years and they do an inspection. The EPA comes out about every five years. Here's an inspection summary on a subpart of our of our treatment, which is the industrial pretreatment. I'm pretty proud of this. Uh, this was kind of a surprise uh, inspection. He showed up four days in advance, and our staff was ready. They had everything documented. They had their phone correspondence and logs all up to date. They knew our industrial base by heart. They were able to contact them and say, the EPA is coming out today. Are you okay with that? And they said yes, because that's the kind of relationship that we have with our industrial clients. And we've got a wor good workforce behind us that they know it all. So again, this was Kathy Skillings in there, and our industrial pretreatment lab coordinator that got us this great letter. So that's part of it. This is a comprehensive spreadsheet that, that kind of lists all the costs. Some of these are closed out, but all in red is the treatment portion of it. Some of this is ongoing, but this you can tell by the bottom figure on the plan improvements how much money we've been spending and how much money we're spending in the collection. This is no longer ignored infrastructure. There's been a lot of movement and it takes time. I talked about my project. The, the most important one we got going on is the biosolids contract. This is a, a new WAS tank. We're using old infrastructure and ret retrofitting it to save money. This uh, new WAS tank is capable of holding multiple days of solids wasting because we got to do that every day. So this will protect us and even out the whole treatment scheme, spe especially if we got downstream activities that we have to halt. That's part of the biosolids contract. That's the new builder, uh, or the blower building. Uh, two new garage doors so that we can get into these high energy efficient blowers and maintain them. This is the biosolids, uh, a new chemical feed building. This is an important uh, key to this project. This uh, chemical feed building will be injecting some ferric chloride into our digester complex. That keeps uh, hydrogen sulfide at bay 
But more importantly, it keeps what we call struvite crystals. It's a complicated chemistry thing that happens in my digester that starts to plug pipes. And every year I gotta, we gotta spend like $30,000 in man hours to clean these pipes out. So this will prevent that in the future. More of the biosolids project. These are new tankage for the polymer feed. This will be implemented in two spots out at our facility. Um, what I'm really happy about this is that currently we use like a dry powder. That powder goes into the air. Employees got to wear masks and face shields. So we're going to go to a wet emulsion, which I feel is more cost effective and also safer for employees. Here's the backbone of the biosolids project. It's the centrifuges. Centrifuges use a centrifugal force to spin the wet sludge and to make a cake. Currently, we, we put out about 15% solids. These things can achieve 27%. The bottom line on that is that we pay for wet ton. It goes onto a big side dump trailer. It goes out to our land application. When we're paying for wet ton, now we're going to get 27% solids. So there's going to be a savings down the road as we make these drier cakes. Really excited about this, but I'm a wastewater nerd, so whatever. <laughs> uh, another part of the biosolids project is these new uh, methane boilers in the digester complex. We replaced two of them because one was already relatively new. These do capture methane that is naturally produced in the breakdown of organic solids in our digesters. And then that methane is captured in these boilers used to heat the digester complex because we're bringing temperatures up to 131 degrees. We got to heat, heat, heat to break down those solids. Uh, this is a part of the satellite uh, wet well, but it's called the crossover structure. This is on Lafayette Street. This is, I, you might remember going through council on this. This is a big deal to us as well, and a big deal for the community because it allows us to manipulate flows from across the river from one side, either the domestic or the industrial. This protects us in a lot of ways. It gives us flexibility. But if we had something catastrophic go wrong with the pipe under the river, we can just manipulate that flow to the other pipe and then investigate what went wrong. We don't need another cattle congress in, in, in our life, right? Dry Run Creek, uh, I think we've kind of talked about Dry Run Creek, but this is kind of a photo that captures what's going on. I know that they're going to be demoing the new, or the old wet well on that here real soon, but I got some criteria they have to meet before they do that. Now I'm going to have Randy talk about the fiber backbone. And then if, we got, if you guys got questions after that, I'll be happy to answer. Good job, Brian. Thank you. Yes, so uh, currently where we're at is we're on the 30% design phase on the fiber backbone, and this is going to be for... Um, giving us that communication that will tie into our SCADA system for both the sanitary and storm sewer. So um, this is going to be huge because currently right now it's kind of on a dialer. We'll get a call in, but it don't necessarily give us the uh, a breakdown as far as what it is. So staff always has to go out there instead of being able to say, if, okay, if we just have a float that's stuck or, or a pump stuck on, they can actually um, – you know, be able to see that right from the SCADA system and, and be able to um, turn it on or off or, or use a redundant, you know, everything that we do, there's always redundancy. We always have a spare. So um, it gives them that capability. So this is actually kind of an exciting um, phase, which we just had our another follow-up meeting on that today. So um, we were moving um, pretty quick on that. So I guess with that being said, um, if you have questions for Brian or sure. I, Yes, I, I just had a quick one. You, you brought up the cattle congress, and we had we had people come before the council and accuse us of, of dumping raw sewage into the river. And there was an the, the DNR investigated that, correct? The, uh, the cattle congress. Yes. Yeah, they were they were part of that. They were well aware of, that, of where we were on that. They so knew that we had since it was under the levy, we had a time frame. We moved really quick on that. So, they well, were well, DNR's aware of everything. Can you doing. can you give us an update on that and, and how that whole thing came out. Congress? Yeah, and how that all came out. Is, What's that? Martin Peterson from the legal department. I've reviewed recent correspondence from attorney John Hall from Washington, D.C. As I understand it, his services were retained after a complaint in 2017 with regard to a direct discharge into the river. 
Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Iowa convened at the grand jury on that issue. In federal uh, court, all criminal indictments are brought in front of and, and returned by the grand jury. It's a little different than state court where uh, we hardly ever use the grand jury to indict uh, criminal defendants. But in the federal system, it's always used. And apparently... In 2017 or early 2018, the grand jury was convened on that issue, and Mr. Hall recently corresponded and said he spoke with the U.S. Attorney's Office and confirmed um, that the original grand jury determined that further action was not appropriate, and the U.S. Attorney's Office recently indicated there is no pending action related to that allegation, and the matter is now closed and has been for some time. Right. Thank, thank you, Martin. Yeah, and I, that's not necessarily related to Cattle Congress. Okay, that was about some, some accusations made in 2017 against our department that we were discharging raw sewage into, our, into, uh, into the river. I, can, I got them flipped around. Right. Uh, um, just I'm to make your, about this too. Yeah. Well, Cattle Congress, and I just wanted to make sure that you're aware, you know, when we're talking about Cattle Congress DNR and everybody was aware that needed to be aware and we took the appropriate action. Mar Marty's referencing uh, accusations that were made in 2017, 2018, and I think a lot of the council remembers that there were pictures provided of, of some, some floatable material and out, outbound flume, and there was all kinds of hearsay that we were pumping raw wastewater sewage into the Cedar River. We don't, we don't do that in our department and we take every means necessary to comply with regulations in our MPDS permit. So basically Marty's got that document that says that issue is closed. What happened at Cattle Congress? Cattle Congress was when we uh, had a force main break Maybe I shouldn't have brought it up. But Cattle, Cattle Congress, we had a force main break. Um, it was underneath the levee, and it was leaking um, into the river. Okay, now this is, th that wasn't an easy, easily repaired item. That, that required us to not only dig under the levee to repair that pipe, but also keep our eyes on the river to make sure that we didn't exceed that elevation and then inundate the, the citizens in the town with, with river water. Um, so that matter was taken care of quite quickly, but it was it was a lot to do as well of accusations that we weren't weren't doing it correctly. Yeah, and I remember sitting here uh, the first one um, and uh, just thinking like I just can't believe people would think we would do something like that. And um, you know I'm just glad uh, we have the report uh, to show that the city was not doing that, which was. Uh, being claimed for the 2007 incident. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, thank you guys for uh, your diligence and your work and your right to mm -hmm. Cattle Congress. Uh, you got old uh, pipes, you got old structure. So that's part of the reason why all of this, the money that we're putting into this to start to uh, redo that so that the system will last us the next hundred years. Hopefully, we'll continue to work on it within that hundred years, but putting it in a resilient infrastructure, that's going to take us uh, to the next 50, 60 years. So, great work. Good job. Um, any other Good job. questions? Any other questions? I wanna, if I may, back up. I remember two weeks ago, Mr. Morrissey had questions and we ran out of time. So, did you wanna answer any of those, or ask any of those questions tonight? Well, Madam Chair, what a memory you have. I'm just shocked. I know. Every once in a while it works. Amazing. I know. It doesn't work often, but sometimes. Because I was going to bring it up. I don't have to now. Good. Yeah, well, um, uh, thank you. And w one of the things with the biosolids that I was wondering, because uh, I brought this up in the past and previous uh, uh, people who were running uh, the show down there, maybe you remember it, Brian, but... Uh, it sure would be nice if the city uh, could do something like this and maybe make a little bit of money, even though they um, might have to break even, and that's making money off our crap. Um, and does the making 
of this, as you described there, the solid, more of a dry cake, does that make it more readily marketable to do something like that where the city Pat, the honest, the honest answer to that is, is no. Um, you're making a drier cake, you're taking moisture out of it. It's still, it's still um, the 503 regs that are part of the DNR and EPA guidelines. There's, there's certain criteria for, you know, what class sludge you have, right? So basically this biosolids contract addressed, you know, outdated infrastructure, preparing us for the future, drier cake, new boilers and stuff. But what it didn't address is, is some of these um, regulations that you have. There'd be extra steps that you'd have to be taken to, to say, mix that with fertilizer or whatever it may be um, for, for citizen application. Okay. Um, I'm not saying it's not, unat not unattainable. You, you could do it. But the last thing you'd want to do is, is spend money on it. Break even would be great, in my opinion. Okay. Um, and uh, what I was wondering, going to all the other questions that I had before, Randy, is um, if I could move there, if that's okay with you. So I guess I just want to make sure, does anybody else have any questions on that? Can the I just ask side? one question that you brought up? You're adding a new department head for safety. And you're going to be addressing safety for your own department. You said you're going to take that um, training citywide. Are you going to address all OSHA compliance? Is that going to be an official training program? So, like I said, when we, you know, when we originally kind of discussed this, it's one of the things that we've been um, part of our safety committee that we've been doing uh, citywide. One of the things, uh, I guess, at the, the onslaught for me anyway, is we weren't necessarily doing everything consistent from department to department, um, especially in public works. Um, so that's why when you know we took this in consideration and looking at what we had a need, that's part of the reasons why we looked at restructuring this. So we wanted to create that position. And then after doing that and visiting with the mayor and, and HR as well, um, you know, we looked at this can also potentially hopefully address um, other departments as well. So when you pretty much take public works, a lot of the training does overlap into parks and leisure and other departments. So um, the only thing I just said is since, since we are the ones that are gonna be um, funding it, I would just like to make sure that we get everything in public works um, kind of addressed as far as what I'd like to see, and then um, be able to expand it further Open throughout it the city. And then that way we have um, more uniformity and continuity. We've needed that for a long time, yes. so good job. So yeah, like I said, it's and the exciting part is, like I said, we, we're just uh, finishing up with the first round of interviews. I'm going to be setting up second here shortly. So um, before too much longer, hopefully I'll be bringing somebody to you to hire. Okay, great. And, and thank you on that because that's yeah. been also a huge need uh, with regards to uh, insurance as well and conversations with okay. PDCM. So the consistency, um, taking a holistic look at how this impacts the entire city. Uh, is good. So thank you for uh, your leadership and trying to figure out a way to make that happen. And thank you too, uh, Mr. Brian. Um, I've never seen someone so passionate about sludge as, as you are, you know. Uh, so we. It's so knowledgeable. So really, and I remember uh, taking a tour what, about uh -huh. 10, 12 years ago and uh, just walking through and hearing you explain what's taking place. It's really a our treatment plant is a phenomenal uh, facility, and it has such an impact, not just for the residents, but also for the future of business. So uh, thank you guys so much uh, for, for all your efforts. Anything else? Just add my thanks, because your department, your whole area has gone through so much, and you've risen to the challenge <coughs> and addressed the problems, and we should all be very proud of what you've accomplished. So thank you. But Thank back to Mr. Morrissey okay. with his questions. Well, one, one final thing, and this fiber backbone, uh, what are all those red dots, Randy? So what those are is a combination of both uh, sanitary and storm lift stations. So that those are pretty much all the different assets for which we are going to be running the fiber to. So that, that way, um, once that gets connected, everything will eventually come back to the wastewater plant. And like I said, that'll um, tie into our SCADA system. And that way we'll be able to have, um, just like what we do into the plant, have uh, full access 
Um, you know, of course, there'll be some updating electronics in those areas as well, too. But um, so uh, um, give us that flexibility, um, you know, to see if there's problems and schedule maintenance and so on and so forth. Because um, it, it won't be just strictly the SCADA, but it'll, it'll tie into our elements uh, uh, work order uh, program that we're also doing as well. Okay, thanks. Um, going back to uh, three weeks ago, okay. uh, I think it was three weeks ago, right? Two. Two? Yeah, two. Oh, okay. Um, was, um, uh, first of all, uh, you had mentioned about the uh, garage mechanics and that there was one position open. That's correct. And I had heard that there was somebody else who was retiring at the end of June. Did that happen so that there's now two positions open? or um, Not that I, I haven't been notified of another person. Um, I know we have individuals who at any time are eligible to retire, but I have not received any of the paperwork for doing that. Okay, so and still you're sitting at one. Yes, correct. And that's not any on any delay hire or anything? Um, we are just in the process now of we've got our personal rec um, information submitted. We're just waiting for the next meeting um, to go forward. I personally, that is one position I hopefully we don't have to wait for. I know during the budgeting process we did, um, you know, reduce one of our mechanics. This is not the one that we were looking at reducing, so I'm hoping that this is one that does not get delayed. But it'll go through the committee. And I'm sure that Mr. Mayor will make sure that there's no delay with that. <laughs> he's just one of four on that committee. Yeah, he's the big yeah. head honcho. So we've got to be nice to the other three of us as well. I'm going to be I nice will do what to I can. in the means in which we budget it for, so we'll talk yes, about we it. we will. We've <laughs> always been creative in finding a way to, to get it done. But uh, we're not talking about mechanics here. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, are. I was. Oh, yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. I was. Yeah. Yeah, we, oh, okay. I we, we, we had questions. From, and, well, yeah, but from yeah. two weeks ago, we had to cut it short, and Mr. Morrissey didn't get to ask all of his questions. So we said that he could carry those forward and ask Randy today. Yes. Should there be an assist? Yeah. Well, I, I suppose if you want to call it that. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead, Mr. Morrissey. Yeah, and, and you had talked about cross-training and uh, how that's done within uh, uh, the central garage, I believe, primarily. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that was one of the areas for which I was giving an example, and I guess I'll just to kind of reiterate that. So uh, when I first started, um, you know, pretty much what the process was is we'd have one individual that was working on fire equipment, another one that was working on, like, automated um, trucks and sanitation. We had one individual that was kind of doing our um, servicing in that. So there wasn't as much cross-training that was taking place. So kind of after looking at that and, re and once we restructured it and we brought the um, – fleet maintenance director on board. That was one of the things that we want to do, especially knowing that we've had um, a lot of individuals that were eligible to retire, especially here in the new future. So when you look at the eight full-time, well, one short right now, but half the individuals we have have, have less than two years of tenure um, with the city. So that's one of the reasons why when we were looking at that, we want to make sure that we're cross-trained. Um, so more than one individual can work on fire trucks or sanitation and so on and so forth. So that's that's what makes it exciting, you know, because they're, um, you know, when you look at all the different types of equipment we have, everything from commercial vehicles to emergency, whether it's police and fire, special vehicles when it's sanitation, construction equipment, loaders, graders, skid loaders, all the way to small weed eaters and, and mowers, you know, like I said, so it's... Um, you know, in this day and age, it's kind of hard to get one person that is specialized in all those areas. So that's why we're, you know, trying to invest in those. And it's also going to be, when we talk about the safety training coordinator, we're also looking at um, expanding that so we can bring more training on board to get them in, um, get our staff some additional training as well, too. More, especially when we look at um, a lot of the unique equipment for which we have. And um, I will tell you, I've actually had some conversation with some other local um cities in the Cedar Valley, you know, to when we were talking about the vendors down the road, trying to get them in and we can collaborate together um, as far as, you know, maybe splitting the cost of, as far as training on some of that special equipment too. But that's going to be a little ways down the road, but it's, it is um, something that we are looking into. Well, and the reason why I brought that up, Randy, was because, uh, I, I mean, I, it, I, you could possibly make a comparison between 
the PSO issue that goes on to Cedar Falls with the dedicated fire versus and the dedicated uh, police and how the cross training the PSO concept has cost as far as the experiential aspect of that and that's my concern if there's cross training that uh, and I know haven't been here for the years I've been here is that that uh, there have been uh, mechanics who have been dedicated just like to the to the fire uh, department or just to the uh, police uh, vehicle maintenance or you know they were specialized and are we losing any of that experiential knowledge by doing the cross training rather than doing the dedicated worker uh, on a specific area concept um, I would actually say no. Um, so, for instance, when I started, you know, evaluating that department, we, we had some equipment in the fire department and sanitation that, that we had vehicles that were down over a year just because we only had one individual that was working on that. And when you look at the amount of the fleet that they have in some of those areas, that made it, you know, quite challenging for them to keep up, not only just maintaining them, but then also making sure that all the preventative maintenance was getting done. So in the process of cross-training, and when I say cross-training, I mean, for instance, we've sent an individual, you know, to fire training, um, one of our new employees, so that they're actually, you know, learning um, how to maintain the pumps and, and do all those things. So it's not that they're just cross-training, you know, while they are cross-training with a full-time employee, you know, young and new, um, but we're also, you know, sending them to school to make sure that they're, they're doing that. And I can honestly say at this point in time, we don't have equipment um, that's been there that long. For the most part, I mean, we have stuff that might be in there for a few weeks, but a lot of that right currently has to do with um, getting the parts. I mean, right now, just with COVID and other, there's a lot of other factors going into it. I mean, that's kind of the case, but I can tell you with the fire department, um, you know, because of the cross train, we were able to kind of get that up. We don't have vehicles that have been in there as long sanitation is the same so yeah it, which has to do with the the cross training for which we have done and uh, I, I mean going back four years at least four years ago i mean that was one of the big issues that was being talked about on council when the subject got brought up was the amount of vehicles the backlog that there was and what you're saying is that that's been caught up on that is correct yep okay. and, and it has to do with a lot of the restructuring and the oversight for which we have you know and being down a mechanic right now does not help but, but we're still, you know, we're still keeping up with that. So, I mean, it's not just, you know, to me, the cross training is protecting the city because at any given time, somebody can leave. And the, the one downside is when you have all that institutional knowledge and, and someone goes to leave, you can't, you're not necessarily going to get all of it, but, you know, as much as you can to make sure that you, we're at least ways doing our due diligence to make sure we're protected. So we do have somebody that knows how to, to do those maintenance. That's, that's doing our job and trying to do it. Okay. Cost effectively and efficiently too. Okay. Uh, another th question that I had from a few weeks back was um, uh, the recycle sites. There's four of them in town. Correct. Um, it looked like one got moved. Um, the one out at Ainsborough got moved up uh, closer to um, I think what was that Blackhawk Street. Correct. Um, yep. And I think he addressed that last time anyway, but. When this had all been discussed and the increase in the fee and, and that, uh, it was said that there was going to be the security was going to be beefed up and um, the uh, cameras, there were going to be monitoring cameras to pick up, especially license plates of people who were dumping illegally. Uh, but then um, also one of the questions was the taking of pictures right with inside the garbage truck of the refuse as it's getting dumped to see if uh, people are uh, illegally putting uh, or dumping stuff into uh, containers where it shouldn't be. Uh, and then a third part of that was the uh, money was supposed to go to hire two more workers to help out, uh, especially with the illegal dumping issues from code enforcement and that. Where are those three things? Okay, so first I'll talk about um, the cameras when it comes to the recycling sites. So um, initially we, we started with um, a less expensive route using like trail cameras. The unfortunate part, 
they were not able to capture the license plates for which we were hoping that they were going to be able to do. So um, with that being said, um, we've actually, it would have been the last meeting we finally um, have been working on getting um, more or less kind of like our traffic cameras is what we're doing. So it's a little bit more expensive, but we should be able to do that. When you, in, in particular, when you're talking about the Ainsboro site, um, we were having a lot of issues with um, unfortunately people that were putting things that not inside the container and it was blowing getting down into the pond and that plus it had to do with the access for the cameras to be able to capture everything so um, prior to my tenure because I can only go back two and a half years but originally it was closer up um, to the entrance of Singing Bird and we're actually going to be splitting the difference we're actually going to be moving it down closer to where the lift station is, but um, staying on the dry side of levee so we don't have to be impacted on that. But it also is gonna give us um, uh, better visibility for our cameras to capture um, individuals who are putting things and stuff out there. So just to kind of give you a little bit of background, our curbside collection program, we've had zero um, contamination um, with that. So we, we, we haven't had anything. Unfortunately, when it comes to our drop-off sites, we've had some uh, contamination issues. It's primarily within the recycling uh, or the plastic portion of it. That's where we're getting the largest portion. So that's where we're really trying to address it with the cameras to capture those. And some of it has to do with the visibility. The other aspect that you did bring up, but I also want to talk about it too, is some of the landscaping and stuff too, which we want to make sure that we can get the cameras and stuff done first, know what's going to work, and then we can try to address the, the landscaping. The other aspect of that, um, just to follow up the two um, employees, yes, we already have those hired and they are on staff. So that's, um, uh, th those two additional individuals have been, been hired. Now when it comes to the cameras for um, the automated trucks, um, that's part of what's called the routeware program. So we're in the, um, the initial um, rollout of that. That's where um, currently the phase that we're in right now is installing the RFID tags. Um, for which we've got the majority um, of the tags in, and that's where the additional staff is also helping with that. Um, and when you talk about the cameras, that is part of what we need to help um, correct some of um, the issues for which, like just like what you were kind of referring to, if we get somebody, say, put a car battery in there that they're not supposed to, where we'll be able to get that picture inside the hopper kind of showing yes, that's, that's an item that wasn't supposed to be in there, and therefore we'd be able to follow up with it. It not only will do that, but if we have an individual, let's just say they didn't set their can out. Um, you know, we're all wanting to provide service, but I can tell you we do have some individuals that um, very frequently we have, don't have their carts out in time. This way it'll also give us that capability, um, you know, to be able to crack down on those individuals and, and be able to do that. That'll be part of our um, policies that we'll be bringing down after we get the, the full implementation um, done. So like I said, we want to make sure that we get all the RFID tags um, installed, um, get all the, the cameras and, and that um, onto the equipment and um, on that portion. And I should probably state, you know, it's kind of part of the rollout. You know, initially when we started um, installing some of the tags, you know, we were, we were going to kind of do a larger press release as far as how we were going to um, kind of tackle that project. The one thing that we've noticed, you know, and like I said, we're just at the very beginning stages of this, and, you know, we have rough, a little over 20,000 tags that we have to put on. Um, we, we've kind of done a little bit of um, notification just kind of on our, on our Facebook page, but the one thing that I don't necessarily want to do is get too much out there is exactly this is how we're going to go do it if for some reason we're not able to obtain that. So right now, just to give you guys a little bit of background on how we are actually doing it, we're focusing on, um, in, on any given day, we can have up to six different routes. So what we're doing is we're focusing on one route um, per week. And then the dry, and um, so we're getting out there right away um, at the beginning of the day, and we have um, individuals associating the, the RFIT tags to the carts that we don't have them. Um, it's um, relatively easy because, I mean, we can see um, you know, if a cart has an R on it, it already has a built-in RFID, so that makes it relatively easy. And if it doesn't, then what we're doing is we're cross-referencing the cart number along with the new RFID tag, and then that's what goes to that account. And the process of, of doing this also, um, it, we're also 
cross-referencing to make sure that the right cart is at the right location. And this is kind of where I, you know, unfortunately, I don't have a site up right now, but where we're kind of showing some of our lost revenues where we had individuals that didn't have the right size cart. You know, one was for 10 years, another one was over 13 years, and just those two alone was a little over three grand worth of revenue that was lost. So once we get this fully implemented, I, um, you know, it, it should be able to correct that. It's also gonna give us the technology for where we're gonna be able to need. So if for some reason a cart ends up at the wrong place, it's gonna show us, you know, cause it's tied into our GIS, the lat long exactly where we did it, time date stamp, so that way we know right where to go get it. Cause that's from past experience and other communities of doing this, RFID tags have been good, but if it's not tied into your GIS to where you know where you pick that up, that's that's the hard part. So that that's where this, you know, software is, is gonna be able to do that. Okay. Can I interrupt for a second, Mr. Morrissey? Because Ms. Klein had a question, and you've had a couple. So we're going to ask Mrs. Klein for her question, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. okay. It isn't a question. I just wanted to pay a compliment. Oh, well, When paid. Mr. Anderson got up and talked about what, you know, happened at, at um, the different areas where we had the legal opinions, I was reminded of when I started all those years ago. And... And there was an atmosphere of distrust. And you know what? I was thinking, that's for me, that's gone away. And for just about all the citizens, I think it's gone away in your department. You just are so open. Your team is so open. I've never, ever had a problem getting an answer from you guys. And you go out of your way to make sure that the layperson understands it. And I've had compliments from the people out there about the same thing, about how you're excessively kind to them and you're very patient. And I just, I wanted to pay you guys and your team who are not here that compliment because it's well-deserved. And um, I thought it needed to be said. So Good job. Good job from all of us. Can I piggyback on something that Mr. Morris is, and, and it, it ties right into what you asked. We get the two new people that you've already hired. At one point, I thought we were maybe going to have those two people help with code enforcement. Has yes. that worked out? Yes. So um, once again, kind of going back to when I was um, originally started, and of course, you know, we, we had to start the recycling program fairly quick because, yeah. like I said, our vendor, well, yeah. we dumped some recycle net in the morning, and that afternoon, we were no longer to take it. So, I mean, we, we kind of had to implement it fairly quick. Um, so we, we were several years, I think at least at that time, if I recall correctly, I think we're at least two years behind. We were at least ways within the same calendar year. Um, we, we were definitely doing a lot better. I would, are we, let's say, 100% caught, caught up as of today? No, we're not. Some of it has to do with, um, you know, some of the size of the cleanups. It's a coordination effort. And I was kind of hoping that, you know, unfortunately we could have um, started the route where more in the winter months because it, you know, we weren't, we didn't normally have the, the yard waste collection and just the timing hasn't worked. So, um, like I said, we're definitely within the same calendar year and I would say definitely um, by fall we'll have everything caught help up. help out and help code enforcement oh, yes. get caught up. Yep. And That's, it's a group effort. It's not just yeah. those, you, you know, we, same thing again, we cross train. So not only are they learning the automated routes, but they're also learning card exchanges and code enforcement and illegal dumps and everything. Yep. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, unless anybody else had some questions. Anybody else want to interrupt? Oh, I'm not going to interrupt Pat, but I You're have questions. I'll, I'll, you know what I'll do? No, go ahead. No, Just no, go sir. Ahead. I will go email ahead. you the questions because I have a whole page of questions. Okay. Oh, boy. Oh. Okay, well, then I'll go okay. back to Mr. Morrison. Okay, final thing, and that is uh, being a person who uses those recycle sites, the four, mm -hmm. one of the things I've noticed, and, and maybe Right Environmental could fix this quickly, I would hope, is that like when you go to plastic or when you go to any of them, uh, they don't say what you can't put in. That would be great because some say different things on them, Randy, and it would be nice to have them be standard and uniform because, uh, as an example, I, I've, go, I've gone there in the plastic part and seeing styrofoam in there. And I know styrofoam's not supposed to go in there. I've gone there and I've seen bags in there. Bags aren't supposed to go in there, but there's nothing that says that they don't. So if people aren't aware of that, then how do they know not to do that? 
So one thing that we have done here recently is we actually have put an informational board up there as far as what is acceptable and what's not on all four locations. So we, we do have that there. Um, but as far as on the containers themselves, you know, it's something I can look into um, as far as whether or not they can try to do some more um, public education there. I know, like I said, I know our we've done it on our Facebook page, and then, like I said, we've also have uh, a new informational board that's at all four locations, you know, trying to um, help educate the public as far as what's acceptable and what's not. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm just speaking from practicality and from using those is that it sure would help if they were right there where they placed those uh, big dumpsters that you can't put this stuff in there. Then it makes it pretty um, evident to anybody who's going to violate those that they're doing so knowingly. And that's where those safety security cameras to me would come in place, yep. Randy. Bill. Is that all of your questions, Mr. Morrison? And comments. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, Dave, Mr. Boson, do you want to try to I, I can put do out a, your... I, I can we've do a got, few but no. let's say, five minutes. Well, I don't know if Randy can answer them in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I will do my I'll best. I'll just email him. How's that sound? Okay. I don't, I, don't wanna, I don't want to disrupt this flow. Okay. Okay. Then any other questions for this afternoon? Thank you for the work yes. you've done through the good and the bad. Yes. We all know. Thank you so much. We appreciate yes. it. Thank you, guys. Yes. Okay, to entertain adjourn. a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. favor, say aye. 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 Okay, terrific. See you back in a few minutes for finance.